let's get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Denise Maringolo and I'm the acting director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities. I'm also an associate professor of history and a scholar of public history. We're really delighted that you've made time to join us for this virtual event. This afternoon's speaker, Dr. Melody Jew, joins us as part of the Spring 2022 Humanities Forum organized by the Drescher Center for the Humanities. We have one more event this semester. On Monday, May 2nd at 6 p.m., UMBC President Dr. Freeman Herbowski III will be our honored speaker for the Drescher Center's annual Daphne Harrison Lecture. His talk is titled American Higher Education at the Crossroads, Reflections on Access and Student Success in the Past 60 Years. That event will be held in person in the Fine Arts Recital Hall. To learn more, I encourage you to look at the Drescher Center website, dreschercenter.umbc.edu, and you can also connect with us on social media. Before we begin, Allow me to acknowledge that UMBC was established upon the land of the Piscataway and Susquehannock peoples. Over time, citizens of many more indigenous nations have come to reside in this region. We humbly offer our respects to all past, present, and future indigenous people connected to this place. While we recognize the importance of acknowledging those who came before us, we also know that truth telling is only a small gesture. We must take action towards the necessary work of repair. I wanna thank the Office of Sustainability and the Department of Media and Communication Studies for co-sponsoring today's event. Um, Q&A will take place directly after the lecture. Questions can be submitted at any time into the Q&A box. To enable the Q&A box, please check, click on the three dots at the bottom right corner of the screen and select Q&A. We will have live captioning during this event. You can enable captioning by clicking on the three dots and selecting multimedia viewer. A very special thanks to Vital Signs LLC for providing their live captioning services this semester and for helping to make the Humanities Forum more accessible. The talk tonight will be recorded and made available on the Drescher Center's YouTube page. Now I would like to turn things over to my colleague, Fan Yang, who's an associate professor in the Department of Media and Communication Studies. I've had the great pleasure of working with Dr. Yang on several projects this semester, and I'm delighted that she'll be introducing our speaker. Thank you so much, Denise. It's really my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Melody Ju, who is an associate professor of English at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She is working across the fields of ocean humanities, science fiction, science studies, and media theory. And she's the author of Wild Blue Media, my one of my favorite books recently uh, that I've been telling everyone. Uh, so the subtitle of the book is Thinking Through uh, Seawater, uh, published by Duke University Press in 2020. And it won the 2020 Speculative Fictions and Cultures of Science Book Award. Congratulations. Uh, and she is also co-editor with uh, Rafiko Ruiz of Saturation and Elemental Politics, which was published by Duke uh, University Press in 2021. And Professor Ju has also published articles in journals, including Gray Room, Configurations, Women's Studies Quarterly, resilience and media plus environment. Her new work explores the mediations of seaweeds in Pacific Ocean contexts. And I have met Melody in person uh, a couple of times in different conferences, and I'm just so happy that you're here and excited to hear your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. Uh, introduction. Um, my thanks to uh, Jessica Berman for the invitation, to Fan for the uh, kind words, and uh, Courtney Hobson for coordinating the tech behind um, this talk today. Okay, so let me go ahead and share screen. And can you hear me okay? Okay. 
All right, uh, time to take the plunge underwater. My uh, talk for today is in entitled Theory Underwater and Diving into Wild Blue Media. In the summer of July 2014, underneath 30 feet of water off the coast of eastern Mexico, I hovered above a field of stony human forms encrusted with a rainbow of multi-species life. Spiny urchins, bright pink tunicates, schools of striped fish. Yet to only focus on the colorful sculptures alone would be to miss an important element. Here I was swimming in seawater, the very medium that made these sculptures possible. The installation was aptly named Silent Evolution by artist Jason DeCaris Taylor, a gesture to the force of seawater carrying vital nutrients and dispersing larvae to grow on the sculptures. Yet as I struggled against a current to gain a longer look, I realized something about the ocean as an environment of interpretation. The photos of the sculptures I had seen before my dive mostly involved an aesthetic of frontality, with the camera positioned vertically as if the photographer were standing looking face to face with the sculpture. Yet, under conditions of current, I was pushed into other points of view, sometimes hovering above or swimming sideways to maintain position, and sometimes it was really difficult even just to try and stay in place. My orientation was off, and what felt comfortable on the land, on land, especially in a land museum, was not easy here. While fieldwork in the humanities has traditionally been the purview of anthropology, my underwater visitations to silent evolution were formative to the development of my book, Wild Blue Media, Thinking Through Seawater, which examines the terrestrial bias in humanities scholarship and shows how the ocean is itself an environment of interpretation. What I mean by environment of interpretation is that the ocean affords specific ways of perceiving and knowing uh, and orienting through language and through particular forms of embodiment. So in this talk, what I call doing theory underwater isn't just forming theory about the ocean as an external environment or external object. It means forming interpretations from within, from submerged points of view. This leads me to ask, to what extent do terrestrial habits inform uh, our writing and thinking? What might we learn if we unmoor ourselves from our desks and consider familiar concepts from underwater conditions of observation? Now, while Blue Media could have been written as a critique of works in Western philosophy and criticism uh, that exemplify what I'm calling a terrestrial bias, and I'm, I'm not entirely attached to this term. You could think of it as terrestrial habits um, if, if you don't like the word bias, but I use it to draw attention to the, the sort of way that our forms of knowing press up against um, terrestrial conditions, even while terrestrial itself signifies a kind of plurality of different um, environments. One might think of deltas, mountains, estuaries. Um, I realize that there, you know, there are many, many types. Um, but to clarify here, um, I imagine a terrestrial bias not as something false or incorrect, but as a necessary partial perspective that responds to several shared constraints. The fact that we need to breathe air, that we're bound by gravity when we move, even people who live on boats and frequently swim um, share these constraints. Uh, yet consider how Martin Heidegger's fourfold includes earth and sky as a essential you know, contrast, but no ocean. David Abrams' Spell of the Sensuous, which I actually quite like, calls our subjective experience of the world the vital and dark ground of all our objectivity, a ground that, quote, goes largely unnoticed or unacknowledged in scientific culture. And here, and you can see this in legal discourse as well, ground and grounding relate to something about truth, something about the experiential, something that can be confirmed. Um, and so this language of ground finds itself um, into um, juridical contexts as well as philosophical ones. Um, rather than extending this list of terrestrial metaphors or just pointing to the fact that it's there, um, in my book, I felt it was more constructive to develop a way or method of attending to the importance of fiction, media, and uh, critical writings. So in Wild Blue Media, I build on work in the field of feminist science studies, specifically drawing on Donna Haraway's theorization of situated knowledge and its critique of a form of objectivity that aspires to a disembodied and universal point of view. Um, this is what Haraway calls the God trick or view from nowhere. 
Yet rather than throwing out objectivity altogether, Haraway advocates for a new understanding of what it means to be objective, marked by, quote, engaged, accountable positioning that takes into consideration things like who wants to ask particular questions in science, who decides they're worth funding. By extension, I also hold on to the term objectivity defined by accountability for point of view. The milieu of the ocean offers an epistemological check on human knowledge formation. In my book, Wild Blue Media, I ask that we consider the observer's milieu in addition to other uh, elements like culture, class, gender, race, ability, other identitarian categories that have had much more attention. Now, as I develop it here, milieu is not simply the climate of a critical text or a general influence, but something that uh, the theorist actively orients within through language. Milieu is a word with a rich etymological history ranging from mechanics to biology that in George Congiam's usage alternates between being centered and being uh, in between or interconnective. In Wild Blue Media, I use the term milieu specific analysis to name a practice of addressing the affordances of specific milieu for specific observers. So throughout, I really try to balance not just environment as something other or external, but really this interaction between particular observers and um, the uh, end milieu or environment uh, together. Um, so the role of the observer here is key for what the ocean is, is largely a matter of for whom. So think about how limited human beings are underwater. We, we can't smell, and yet so many creatures use chemosensation to um, detect uh, all kinds of things in their lives. Um, or think about whales and dolphins. They use sound to echolocate. Sharks have an outstanding sense of smell and even electrical sense, sensation. Um, given this uh, plurality of other modalities of sensing, um, we might invert a famous saying from Heidegger, such that it is we who are poor in world underwater um, when uh, or sorry, we are who are poor in world, when what is under consideration is not land, but ocean. Milieu-specific analysis of ocean literature and media attends to features like temperature, salinity, pressure, sound propagation, visual opacity, conditions that be can be challenging for a human to navigate without technical mediation. So if one unacknowledged standard of objectivity has been a human being standing on the ground, then underwater points of view offer quite different perspectives. Wild Blue Media explores conditions for doing theory underwater through both literal and imaginative strategies, asking how might certain concepts in media theory look different underwater? Using a method I call conceptual displacement or simply submerging concepts, each chapter in Wild Blue Media submerges a different term in media theory in the ocean, specifically, interface, inscription, and database. And the fourth chapter is on underwater museums, which I use to sort of uh, gather reflections on the previous three altogether. While conceptual displacement can benefit from direct experience underwater, such as swimming or diving, uh, it can also be an imaginary foray. So I often think about how Rachel Carson, an American fisheries biologist who loved the ocean and wrote three books on it prior to her classic environmentalist text, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson never had the opportunity to learn how to scuba dive. And yet in The Sea Around Us, published in 1951, she wrote the following, although we can no longer live in the ocean like our aquatic ancestors, we can still, quote, re-enter it mentally and imaginatively, inventing mechanical eyes and ears that can recreate for our senses a world long lost, but a world that, in the deepest part of our subconscious mind, we've nev never wholly uh, forgotten. Because we rely on so many instruments and media forms to make the ocean knowable, Wild Blue Media draws on a wide archive that includes diving memoir, speculative fiction, data visualizations, digital artworks, and underwater sculptures. This reflects my training as a scholar of comparative media studies, a term that Catherine Hales develops in her book, Writing Machines, to name a close attention to meaning in relation to media forms. Um, so today I offer a window into the way that Wild Blue Media develops a method of doing milieu-specific theory um, or theory underwater. 
um, is not only about generating ocean specific terminology, but rather testing theory within, under, and through the ocean. And this is why I think of the ocean as a science fictional environment, because of its capacity to estrange what we thought may have been familiar. Theory underwater takes the ocean um, precisely as this sort of speculative, of speculative environment, producing what literary critic Darko Suvin called cognitive estrangement, a shift in the expected norms of the observer. And on that note, uh, let us turn to the strange tale of the vampire squid for our first foray into theory underwater and its implications for the humanities. Um, so the first part of this talk will focus on the vampire squid and inscription, um, the second on um, interface. So excerpts from chapter two and chapter one of my book. Okay. So vampire squids are all over popular culture and political cartoons, providing a potent form for imagining configurations of power, communication, and the opening or closure of freedom. Matt Tybee uh, famously called Goldman Sachs a great vampire squid uh, wrapped around the face of humanity. Uh, we might also think of the violent kraken in Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, or even the very first episode of the original Star Trek called The Man Trap, which featured a tentacled, salt-sucking femme fatale. Although the vampire squid seems a ready-made villain, other figurations of cephalopod bodies speak to the ability of individual people to uh, connect with each other in terms of movement or communication. When I taught English in Hong Kong, the prepaid card I used for public transportation was called an octopus card, which felt appropriate since the rail lines radiate from the center of the transit map like tentacles. Then there's the famous Japanese painting, Dream of a Fisherman's Wife, where the octopus is much more erotic. It is within this very tradition of uh, squid as embodiments of both connection and takeover that we find Willem Flusser's strange text, Vampiritutus Infernalis, published in 1987. What makes Flusser's tale about the vampire squid distinct from other media texts is that it approximates a vampire squid point of view while addressing the epistemological question of how the reader or media theorist comes to know about the vampire squid from their own constraints of human physiology in a terrestrial environment. Flusser describes his method as, quote, diving into the situation of the vampire squid and implicating ourselves within it. So he writes, as we cannot observe the depths through phenomenological methods, we, do, we, or he, do not know how to dive into the oceans. We shall aim to do it by an intuitive method, diving into Vampirotuthis. And as we assume, therefore, his point of view upon his habitat, that is planet Earth, at the end we shall be surprised to observe that Earth has become even stranger than Mars or Venus. For Flusser, diving into Vampirotuthis names a speculative methodology for estranging our point of view on our own terrestrial habitation and encountering, quote, a world that is not apprehended and comprehended by hands, as is ours, but by eight tentacles. Uh, the text Vampirotuthis Infernalis adopts taxonomy as a storytelling structure for this vampire squid's fictional relation to the human. It has no traditional plot with rising action and a climax. Instead, the text reads uh, much like a scientific report about the vampire squid with sections on its, its uh, genealogy, abyss, and even culture. Flusser writes, quote, their conches are our fish, their snails are our birds, their cephalopods are our mammals. The climaxes of the fable are the moments when the reader recognizes that the vampire squid um, is not just uh, another being to imagine the habitat of, but itself a kind of um, allegory or for a photographic negative through which Flusser develops an image of humanity. Uh, Flusser himself is a comparativist, or better, he takes comparative anatomy, comparative um, vampire squid and human anatomy, as a pretext for um, examining different ways of knowing, or what I call comparative epistemology. The vampire squid's alterity arises from its um, body plan and its abyssal environment, suggesting a different philosophical perspective on the world. If we take for, um, if we assume that the vampire squid is also highly intelligent. Whereas our vertebrate physiology is like that of a coat hanger with shoulders and spine standing up in response to gravity, Flusser writes that, quote, the spiral is the fundamental theme of the molluscan organism and mollusks, um, uh, cephalopods like the vampire squid are um, evolved from mollusks. 
Uh, and this is a position responsive to a buoyant and liquid environment. Further, he writes that as vertebrates, our dialectic is linear, while the vampire squids would be coiled. We think straight, he thinks in a circle. That is because our world is a plane and his a volume. Going further, Flusser writes, vampire squid are whirlpool, whirlpool animals with coils that tend to uncoil. There are springs that tend to stretch, fists that tend to open into flat palms, and as they uncoil, they release the accumulated energy of a spring. This may explain their extraordinary ferociousness. Um, now, if you're thinking this is all hyperbole, uh, you would be correct. Um, you know, Flusser is being extremely dramatic here. And uh, the real vampire squid, the, or the, the vampire squid that um, is not the subject of media theory or fiction, but is um, the little one floating outside in the ocean, um, is actually not that long. It's about six inches. It's a detrivore. It eats detritus or marine snow that's floating from the um, floating from above. And I think they're actually quite cute. They're endearing with these sort of big globular blue eyes. And uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium um, has this large a canyon that's sort of outside of itself uh, that. Uh, it, or that's near the shore, and so they, they often take deep sea vessels and we'll see vampire squid floating around there, and they're, again, not that big. Um, so we might ask then, why, why the hyperbole? Why does Flusser do this? Um, and uh, I think that it, in one way, it's um, his way of just uh, using a creature to stimulate a sort of fiction and then imagine the ways in which different body plans could, in fact, give rise to different affects, different orientations, different ways of of knowing. Um, now, Flusser isn't the only speculative writer to compare animal and human forms of orientation that are specific to their normal environments. For example, American science fiction writer Ursula Le Guin uh, wrote the short story, The Author of Acacia Seeds, a story that shares much in common with Vampirotuthis infernalis through its imagination of the writing of ants. In this story, a scientific team studying animal languages stumbles upon a series of fragmentary messages written on acacia seeds by an ant. Now, the scientists have difficulty interpreting the meaning of the phrase on one seed, eat the eggs up with the queen, until they remember that ants um, live underground. And they're trying to understand what happened in this um, sort of ant rebellion. Um, so Le Guin says the following, to us, up is a good direction. Not so, or not necessarily so, to an ant. Up is where food comes from, to be sure, but down is where security, peace, and home are to be found. Up is the scorching sun, the freezing night, no shelter in the beloved tunnels. Exile death. Therefore, we suggest that this strange author, in the solitude of her lonely tunnel, sought with what means she had to express the ultimate blasphemy conceivable to an ant. So in other words, um, in a human translation, it's not up with the queen, but rather down with the queen. Here, Le Guin draws our attention to the ways that human language or the use of prepositions in particular embed a variety of orientational relationships to the Earth's surface. And, you know, think about this in your own life, like um, I'm feeling up today or uh, I got, um, you know, I got up on the right side of the bed versus I'm feeling down. Um, so understanding the message of the ant requires understanding how certain orientations like up and down have emotional connotations that could be specific to the life world of the ants. So here I'm comparing the underground with the ocean for a reason. And like the ocean abyss, Le Guin's subterranean milieu teaches us to rethink the ways we subconsciously value orientations through our own usages of prepositions. Um, now, here I'm drawing strongly on George Lakoff and Mark Johnson's classic linguistic study, Metaphors We Live By, from 1980. Um, and contrary to the belief that metaphor is merely ornamental language, Lakoff and Johnson argue that metaphor is a model of conceptual structure that, quote, involves all natural dimensions of our experience. Lakoff and Johnson's discussion of orientational metaphors is especially useful to show how metaphors subtly structure the way that we cognize the world. Um, I gave a few examples earlier, but they write how they discuss how the direction up correlates with happy emotions in general, whereas down, down tends to correlate with sad ones. Um, I'm feeling up today or that boosted my spirits uh, compare or contrast strongly with I fell into a depression or my spirits sank. Um, this is not to say that embodiment and environment 
are entirely deterministic and one can always think of counterexamples like I'm down for dinner tonight. But in that example, down means commitment. Down doesn't mean something tired or you know sad. Um, so all these ways of speaking are constantly being uh, tested by lived experience. Yet it is, it, is, it is precisely this class of orientational metaphors that take Lakoff and Johnson into science fictional territory. Um, and I wanna to read to you uh, the following passage from Metaphors We Live By. Up is not understood purely in its own terms, but emerges from the collection of constantly performed motor functions having to do with our erect position relative to the gravitational field that we live in. Imagine a spherical being living outside any gravitational field with no knowledge or Im imagination of any other kind of experience. What could up mean to such a being? The answer to this question would depend not only on the physiology of the spherical being, but also on its culture. So, starts to sound a lot like a vampire squid. Uh, and so I really see this passage in conversation with um, Flusser's own thought experiment to, to imagine the vampire squid or, um, uh, or you know, another creature that, that, that floats. Um, and this is a very science fictional passage um, and one that teaches us how to look for elements of terrestrial bias beyond just noun and verb phrases um, like grounding an argument um, and a lot of work in um, the ocean humanities has tried to point out precisely that a lot of the places where we get our descriptions of the ocean come from terrestrial places like sea lettuce sea hare the naming of these animals often draws on a kind of um, you know terrestrial analog uh, but even beyond noun and verb phrases what i'm trying to point through to um, in this chapter is uh, the way that prepositions also matter to uh, examining um, how our landedness um, influences the way we value directionality. And this intuition um, shares kinship with French philosopher Paul Ricoeur's writings on metaphor, which remind us that metaphor doesn't have to be about the substitution of noun for noun, but can also occur on the level of a sentence and often borrows from sensory motor experiences. For this reason, sentence level metaphor matters because it indicates how speakers position themselves in space, which occurs again, not through nouns alone, but also through prep prepositions. So looking to preposition usage is a key technique for identifying areas of terrestrial bias. Now in the longer chapter, I show how Vampirotuthis is an allegory about photography uh, and compares very closely with Flusser's own writings on photography. Um, this tale uh, isn't just about how the vampire would speak, vampire squid would speak about its world, but also about how it would communicate through different kinds of underwater media, like ink clouds, skin paintings, all kinds of underwater messaging. Um, since human tendencies towards inscriptive writing, like a mark on a page, um, or even uh, etchings on a stone um, don't always work underwater or hold up over long periods of time. Paper would disintegrate and even stone would be crusted over by ocean organisms that would want to grow on any available surface. And so this leads me to the following questions. Oh, let's see. If uh, to inscribe means to make a mark or a cut on a surface, could inscriptions exist in water? Or would liquids like the vampire squids imagined ink clouds constitute examples of non-inscriptive media since liquids cannot hold um, marks as such? Could we say that Flusser succeeds in imagining forms of non-inscriptive media in the deep sea? So the answer to this I think is somewhat complicated and has to do with how we account not just for the ontology of media but also for the observer. Uh, Catherine Hale's definition of inscriptive technologies um, is helpful in thinking through this, um, where she defines them as a device that must initiate material changes that can be read as marks. Um, in this definition, it's not just the stability of marks on a substrate that matters, but also the presence of a reader, be they human, animal, or machine. So inscript uh, that inscriptions can be read as marks involves a legible record and a reader to whom they make sense. Um, and in this understanding, inscription has to do with a subject specific recognition of an inscription as such, not just its ontological status as marks on this page or stone. 
And uh, this definition, I think, raises questions about the ontology of ink, um, which presumably could be seen as inscription on paper if it's legible to a reader. So think about, you know, my notes here in the computer ink that went into make, making these. Um, even despite its materiality, uh, original materiality as a fluid before it dries. Um, but to help us think through this, I want to turn uh, now to the film Arrival, um, which has, uh, I think, a nice kinship with Flusser's uh, Vampire Squid text, directed by Denis Villeneuve, um, but based on Ted Chiang's short story, uh, The Story of Your Life. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on the story that are uh, exceed the scope of this paper, so I'm happy to talk about this more in Q&A. Um, it's a brilliant story, uh, but uh, the film Arrival illustrates the very contradiction at the heart of non-inscriptive media. Um, the film imagines a crisis of visitation where octopus-like aliens descend to Earth in crescent-shaped ships, welcoming a small group of humans up into their cavities. The protagonist uh, and linguist Louise um, faces the challenge of learning to communicate with the aliens, um, whom they name heptapods, for their seven appendages, which are radially symmetric around a bulbous head. Louise attempts to communicate with the heptapods across the interface of this glass-like divider, separating the gray luminous fog of the heptapods' habitat from the theater-like space of human beings. It, was, it, it is within this gray fog that the heptapods attempt quote-unquote written communication using a starfish-like hand to secrete an inky black calligraphy that magnetically swirls into the desired configuration, like circular brushstrokes that stabilize just long enough to see before dissipating, almost like a version of Flusser's ink clouds. In order to respond, Louise and her team photograph, digitize, and analyze the ephemeral writings, separating them into component parts that they can use as um, an alphabet of such to compose sentences in response. Um, Louise then uh, composes a response by selecting these captured elements of heptapod writing onto her digital tablet, arranging them in a meaningful circle or sentence, and then projecting this final semiogram on a large TV screen. What is perhaps most striking about the visuality of the scene is that the liquid and digital are seen as uh, workable substitutes for each other uh, and manage to facilitate communication despite the difference in materiality between the heptapod ink and the digital image. The writing system appears to be legible whether it takes place in a liquid medium or in a digital medium, um, which again echoes Hales's observation that inscription technologies um, make changes that are read as marks, um, not just are ontologically, you know, exist as marks. Um, and this underlies her distinction between inscription and uh, not anti-inscription, but what she calls incorporation at the end of how we became post-human. Okay, so long quote here. In contrast to inscription is incorporation. An incorporating practice such as a goodbye wave cannot be separated from its embodied medium, for it, exi it, it exists as such only when it's instantiated in a particular hand making a particular kind of gesture. It is possible, of course, to abstract a sign from this embodied gesture and represent it in a different medium. For example, drawing on a page, the outline of a stylized hand, um, I think of an emoji, um, with wavy lines indicating motion. In this case, however, the gesture is no longer an incorporating practice, rather it's been transformed precisely into an inscription that functions as if it were independent of any particular instantiation. And so the word here, uh, I think that's key is transformation, showing how an embodied gesture like the wave of a hand or even the secretion of ink can be so easily captured and separated. If we follow Hales's point that the reader can abstract many things out of a material instantiation, then non-inscriptive media could never be a stable ontological category. Non-inscriptive media would simply be those that have not yet been captured in an inscriptive medium. Okay, so think about Snapchat here, right? Like it's supposed to, um, it's uh, supposed to be ephemeral, but of course there's always counter applications for capturing or uh, screenshotting that which was designed to disappear. Um, and I have uh, Nagar Motahede to think for um, that comparison. Um, so even if you text me an image designed to disappear for a few seconds, 
I can always take a screenshot of it for future, for future use, just like Louise does for the inky heptapod writing. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the reason I bring this all up is that a purely materialist analysis of uh, sort of liquid media versus, say, written or inscriptive media forgets the agency of the reader in reading, in recognizing something as an inscription or a mark. Um, okay, so uh, I think that the, uh, the heptapod writing becomes inscriptive at the moment of digital or photographic capture transformed into manipulable pixels on a tablet. Um, however, um, I think the story gets a, you know, gets a little more complicated because the most lasting effect uh, or residue of learning heptapod writing actually I don't think is inscriptive. It actually has to do with Louise's perception of time. So throughout Arrival, Louise has a series of flash forwards that anticipate the birth of her future child who will be terminally ill. What she comes to realize in this process of learning heptapod writing is that learning this method of writing, um, which has a two dimensional grammar, um, and one has to know the end of the sentence before one can even begin writing or composing it. This learning this writing has shifted the way she orients in time. It seems to be an effect of composing the semiographs, um, a process described in more detail in the short story version. Um, yet unlike Chinese characters or kanji, which stand for either one word or part of a word, heptapod semiographs are entire sentences or even paragraphs. Writing the semiograph requires knowing the entire trajectory of the sentence and one line might participate in several grammatical components. Thus, to get to the proportions of the sentence correct, you have to anticipate what the whole thing will look like. Um, even though the heptapods eventually leave, which is an, an irony of the title arrival, um, Louise is forever changed by this new consciousness in time, peppered by future memories of her child. It would be a mistake to say that learning heptapod writing marks Louise or reinscribes her subjectivity. I think it'd be more accurate to say that learning heptapod writing reorients Louise within the stream of time. She no longer sees time as linear, but always already saturated by what will happen. So if we take a purely ontological focus on media, again, fluids versus solids, I think this misses the point. Um, what we miss uh, in that dichotomy is the important valence of um, acquiring orientation. In my interpretation, the real residue of the heptapods is not liquid writing as such, but the persistence of a new orientation, or might we say gravitation, within the flow of time. In this sense, non-inscriptive media could include the experience of learning gymnastics, um, swimming or scuba, dance, sign language, all these incorporating activities um, through which the body acquires a new set of orientational habits that persist over time. So if, as Sarah Ahmed has written, gender is also a matter of orientation, um, something I discuss more in the introduction to the book, uh, we could ask, might something like gender also be thought of in terms of non-inscriptive um, mediation? So gender not as inscribed, but as this persistence of uh, orientation or gravitation. Um, now, so far, I've focused on the liquid qualities of the ocean um, and their implications for thinking about language and media. Uh, yet these are not the only material qualities of the ocean that matter, and indeed Flusser's depiction of the abyss, while so valuable for showing how linguistic orientation is contingent on environment, um, misses something important about the milieu-specific qualities of the ocean. Um, and actually, I get into this more in um, Chapter 3 when I talk about how um, digital uh, sort of mimicry of the ocean tends to select particular qualities of the ocean like its visual qualities but not or sometimes sonic but not um always other qualities so yes the ocean is um, dark and liquidy but it's also an environment with enormous pressure many science fictions have imagined uh other details that aren't pressure, so visual and tactile details. Um, we could name Solaris, Adore into Ocean, Nettie Okorafor's novel Lagoon, um, but none of these have a sustained meditation on the role of pressure. Uh, ocean media are the same way. 
Um, many video games and visualizations like Google Ocean Street View allow you to sort of zoom around at um, any depth and just pop up to the surface uh, whenever you want um, without consequence. So none of these embed um, pressure as a meaningful or key feature of representing movement in the ocean. Um, but if you actually go scuba diving, pressure is the most important quality. Um, so in order to address the phenomenological experience of the ocean as an environment of pressure, uh, I now turn to material from my, the first chapter of my book um, on the minor literature of diving memoirs, um, specifically uh, writings by the French diver Jacques Cousteau and American scientist um, Sylvia Earle. Okay. All right. So. When you learn to become a scuba diver, the ocean's pressure is perhaps its most significant feature. Every 33 feet of water is equivalent to the pressure of an entire atmosphere. Your depth determines um, the pressure of air that you breathe from your regulator. And for those not familiar, that's the piece that sounds like Darth Vader where you go sort of, you know, breathe in and out very laboriously. The higher pressure air that you breathe, the more gas that your bloodstream absorbs. Um, and as your bloodstream absorbs all this gas, um, the more time you need at the end of the dive to decompress um, at a shallower depth. And that's just when you kind of sit there at 15 feet and slowly inhale and exhale. Um, and uh, Jacques Cousteau described this process as, quote, the same principle as opening a bottle of champagne. Um, the CO2 in the champagne, which bit, has been under pressure, by the cork expands theatrically when liberated. So does the nitrogen of the diver's body um, when he passes into lighter water pressure. Now, when I learned how to dive, um, the it was in North Carolina. So the metaphor used was a soda can, not a champagne. And uh, it's like, when, you know, you don't want your soda can to explode. So you pop the top very slowly. This is how the same principle was explained to me. Um, now, learning how to scuba dive provided me with the experiential literacy necessary to read and understand how Cousteau develops the ocean as an environment of pressure in his memoir, The Silent World, um, which was uh, published in 1953, uh, three years before the, um, the Academy Award winning, winning film of the same name. Um, now, the reason why I focus on the written memoir over the film is that it contains more detailed descriptions of underwater phenomenology. After uh, uh, Cousteau and Emile Gagnon successfully tested the first aqualung in 1942, Cousteau reflected, quote, from this day forward, we would swim across miles of country no man had known free and level with our flesh feeling what the fish scales know. Uh, flesh feeling what the fish scales know suggests a kind of uh, sensuous epistemics. For if what the fish do naturally is move underwater, then to feel what the fish scales know is to become partially fish or menfish, the gendered term Cousteau liked to use, symptomatic of a masculinist posthumanism. Um, now, most of the text is episodic in structure, uh, with each chapter moving from adventure to adventure. Uh, but for now, um, I'd like to treat Cousteau as a sort of unwitting media theorist, um, which is actually similar to how I treat Flusser as well. Now, in Cousteau's recollections, air is not only the medium of human survival underwater, but also part of the technical interface of scuba diving itself. How you breathe not only keeps you alive, but also affects your movements, um, since the lungs are like two balloons that um, allow you to rise slightly on the inhale and sink slightly on the exhale. Um, and the lungs are perhaps the most important interface in diving, um, that tissue that allows gas to pass from the, their open chambers into, into your bloodstream. However, if you take the lungs as interface, it, it is one that is so different from computer screens, you know, this, this thing that you're looking at right now, um, that it merits an entirely different way of uh, an entirely different accounting than existing theories of the interface in media studies. Um, I won't go into this at length, but there's, there's more detail in the, the book chapter. Uh, the transcorporeal process of gas exchange in the lungs contrasts with the solidity of media technologies like screens, whose glass forms a kind of smooth boundary. And this fundamental porosity characterizes what uh, ocean humanities scholar Astrid Nimanis um, has 
described as her view of her feminist view of post human being, a view that starts with a conception of human being as always already open to watery uh, material flows. This post human openness, however, carries with it a degree of vulnerability, as we easily see in examples throughout the silent world. Um, Cousteau's early diving experiments involved uncertainty about what he called the quote limits of the lung, how deep one could go and for how long. Um, in one anecdote, Cousteau experimented with breathing pure oxygen. Um, this is a bad idea. You pass out earlier than with just regular air. Um, but at the time, this was not known. Um, and in fact, breathing pure oxygen can cause poisoning when breathed um, at high concentrations. Um, whoops, did we skip? Okay, here we go. Um, Cousteau writes, I, dove the, I dived to the boundary of oxygen. I was accepted in the sea jungle and would pay it the compliment of putting aside my anthropoid ways, clamp my legs together and swim down with the spinal undulations of a porpoise. Then my lips began to tremble uncontrollably. My eyelids fluttered. My spine bent backward like a bow. With a violent gesture, I tore off the weight belt and lost consciousness. Now, of course, he was alive to, you know, uh, report this. So um, in the end, he was fine, but it, you know, it's a very dangerous practice. Um, but here we might note that the boundary of oxygen is uh, not just a physical location, but a physiological threshold premised on gas accumulation. Um, so here, it's not just that the lungs are an interface, um, but actually a surface through which the volume of the whole body is absorbing gas. Um, and this danger of accumulating too much saturated gas in the blood um, characterizes nitrogen narcosis or um, colloquially rapture of the deep um, or what divers call being narked. Um, I've dove to 90 or 100 feet and I haven't felt this yet, so I can't actually report on my own experience. Um, so I have to take Cousteau at his uh, you know, word and description here. But like Cousteau's experience of breathing pure oxygen, his deep diving adventures uh, challenge media theory's conception of the interface as a surface between two fluids. Instead, it would be more accurate to say that the interface is a saturated is the saturated volume of the whole body. Um, and I'll briefly mention that uh, I have uh, I co-edited a collection on the concept of saturation with Rafiko Ruiz um, called Saturation and Environmental Politics. Uh, which was just published with Duke Press um, last fall. So if anyone's checking out the Duke Press fall sale, <laughs> um, feel free to uh, look out for saturation as well. Okay, um, now one of the implications of paying attention to saturation thinking and the ocean as a volume, the ocean as an environment of pressure, the body as a volume, has to do with how we imagine amphibiousness um, and our, its reputation as the sort of um, uh, ability to live in land and water equally um, or to transition between these, these two. Um, I want to suggest a different definition of amphibiousness that has more to do um, with the experience of alienation from one world as the price of venturing into another. And to elucidate this, I want to turn to Sylvia Earle's diving memoir, uh, Sea Change, A Message from the Oceans. Okay, so Sylvia Earle is an ocean activist and the former chief of the National Ocean and Atmospheric Agency, or NOAA. Um, with a, you know, note the biblical reference there. Um, and in 1970, she spent two weeks at an underwater laboratory um, in the Tektite project um, with a team of all female scientists. Um, here is a uh, historic image of the, the team descending into the water. Living in an underwater habitat provided Earl with unlimited diving excursions because the pressure of the submerged habitat and ambient water was equal. Later, she would have to spend 21 hours decompressing in a hyperbaric chamber, but she felt it was worth it to get to know the fish, um, whose habits were um, as familiar as those of neighbors. Um, and she talks about taking advantage of an extended passport. Now, the word passport is a fitting description for the conditional belonging involved in diving that refigures how theorists think about amphibiousness, not as belonging to two worlds at once, but rather as uh, acclimatizing to one world at the cost of temporarily excommunicating oneself from the other. In one recollection, 
Earl describes an incident where sand clogged her regulator, cutting off her air supply far from the habitat. Sunlight and uh, air were only 71 feet away overhead, but I was separated from them by a physiological barrier as effective as a brick wall. Uh, racing for the surface for air with my tissue saturated with gas would spell swift disaster, bubbles in my blood, pain, possible paralysis, and even uh, death. And she was fine. She shared her air with her, um, uh, air, the air supply with a dive buddy and made it back to the habitat. Um, but she also quotes Robert Stenuit um, describing a similar kind of picture. Um, so Stenuit writes, living in the depths, I've become in certain ways a creature of those depths adapted to their pressures. Now the human environment is temporarily intolerable to me. I need pressure. I must wait and save inside this life-saving prison of a decompression tank until I've been slowly weaned and once made um, once more fit to live on Earth. Um, Earl and Stenuit's descriptions uh, show how tissue saturation is a process of becoming excluded from land, um, and in Stenuit's case, specifically through the maternal imagery of incubation, language of rebirth, and weaning. Now, one recurring narrative pattern in, a, in sea change is Earl's uh, adoption of the perspective of uh, an alien visitor relative to the ocean. Um, she's also really famous and has like kids books written about her and a Lego figure, so I thought I'd include this. Um, and regarding her first experience diving, she writes, I was supposed to be the watcher, but I found myself the watchee, the center of attention of a bunch of curious fish, apparently mesmerized by the strange bubbling bean that had just fallen through their watery roof. So here, the first contact narrative is flipped, um, where the human diver is the alien coming from outer space, dropping by to visit, visit the native fish. Um, and for Earl, this experience is not about disengagement, but um, she writes that rather like astronauts um, charged on behalf of humankind to bear witness to sites not yet within reach of most, it seems to me that those who travel in the deep sea have significant news to share. And indeed, um, if diving engenders a temporary alienation from land, um, perhaps it provides the precondition for an ethics of care. Earl points out that the word fathom comes from the Old English meaning embracing arms. Uh, it was once defined by an act of parliament as the length of a man's arms around the object of his affections and later became a nautical term for six feet. So as a verb, fathom means to plumb the ocean depths or probe their mystery. But it is telling that the etymological history has to do with measurement by way of a human embrace. So for Earl, fathoming is about measuring oneself against the conditions of immersion in the ocean, involving oneself in practices of care. Um, so to really think about the lungs as an interface requires some fathoming. Uh, this involves a certain literacy about the ocean as an environment of pressure and understanding its effects. Um, and the lesson I want to take away from my discussion of interface um, is this, that this, uh, the lungs as interface um, and the volume, is, the volume of the body as an interface teaches us to look for other instances that aren't just about unyielding surfaces, but are about molecular exchange distributed across a volume. In a stunning analogy to the human body, ocean advocate Christina Gerrida reflects that, quote, often referred to as the blue heart of the planet, um, the global ocean is vital for maintaining life as we know it on Earth. I prefer to call it the blue lungs of the planet, for ocean phytoplankton supply 50% of the oxygen we breathe. So if the ocean is the blue lungs of the planet, it's possible and necessary to see interface as a matter of saturation and volume, not just a surface. And this helps us recognize that anthropogenic influence doesn't stop at the surface of the water, but can extend um, deeply into it. So one implication of doing um, milieu specific theory or theory underwater, um, as I've demonstrated today, um, uh, involves debates in literary studies on surface reading versus symptomatic reading. Um, I go into this in more depth in the chapter, but I think that what both surface and symptomatic reading have in common is an observer standing outside the ocean or surface gazing down into it. Um, and on that level, they don't question the positionality of the observer to look at, down, and through. Um, this is where milieu-specific analysis has something to contribute. Thinking with actual oceans and specific observers, um, whether human or vampire squid, opens the way for other kinds of physical factors to come to uh, matter for models of interpretation in media theory and um, literary theory. 
rather than an assumed binary of surface and depth, one might imagine an immersed observer negotiating multiple surfaces, perhaps through a clouded milieu. The physiology of diving that I've been describing necessitates other hermeneutic models. Perhaps the interpreter begins from a condition of depth already saturated or even alienated from a surface. By thinking through the ocean as a milieu, perhaps we can begin to proliferate other spatialities of interpretation that are possible for a situated um, human observer. The oceans prompt a um, fundamental re-examination of our underlying environmental poetics and uh, metaphors and the concepts and orientations and theoretical positions we take. Working with a radically situated knowledge specific to the ocean is ultimately about examining how we tell stories and design media and questioning the valuations uh, built into each. All right, thank you. Oops, okay. We can unshare. Oh, okay. Um, I just realized I don't know. There we go. There's stop there sharing. Go. Okay. Now you've turned your camera off. So, um, but while okay, there we go. go. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Melanie, for that presentation. Um, for those in the audience, my name is Courtney Hobson. I am the program coordinator for the Gesture Center for the Humanities, and I'm going to kick us off with our Q and A. Um, just as a reminder. Um, you can type in your question either in the chat box or the Q&A box, and we will get to it in a timely manner. So if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to, to type them or thoughts. Fawn? Hi, I'm going to take advantage of my panelist privilege here to <laughs> raise my hand first. Uh, thank you so much, Melody. It's so nice to refresh the memory of the joy of reading your book uh, through this talk. And one of the popular cultural reference that came to mind when you were talking about the vampire squid and the octopus was this film that got pretty popular during the pandemic, My Octopus Teacher. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I would imagine quite a few in the audience might have. Uh, just curious about your take, because I've heard mostly praises of the film. And the one connection I could think of, uh, at least aesthetically, there was some attempt to kind of uh, lend some attention or call attention to this environment, uh, the pressure that you mentioned that typically is erased in visualization of the ocean. Uh, but of course, there are perhaps other issues of the perspectives and subjectivity yeah. uh, of the film that could be questioned. So maybe as a start, you can share with us some thoughts. Thanks for your question. I mean, uh, that's such a such a great um, point of discussion and, and window into uh, human octopus uh, relations. Um, oh, there's so much to say about this. Uh, I think one of the things that stood out to me first was some of the differences between uh, free diving and scuba diving. So in free diving, you uh, wear a weight belt so that you can um, counter your own buoyancy and more easily dive underwater. Um, and in free diving, you know, you, you spend as much time on the ocean floor as you can hold your breath and then you have to go back up and the environment that, um, that, uh, the, uh, that Craig, um, I'm forgetting his last name, but Craig, the protagonist of my octopus teacher, um, you know, was in was, you know, maybe probably not more than 20 feet. So it's pretty shallow. It's like a sort of coastal area you can get into. And, uh, that was a. I would, you know, like, like an interested, interesting narrative constraint and uh, actual constraint in the whole film because he was on a timer. He had maybe, you know, three, four minutes per, you know, per submergence and he'd have to go back up again. He wasn't bringing heavy scuba equipment. And so, um, uh, and, and he talked about the virtues of that for encountering life too. Uh, so not having bubbles, maybe a little less disturbing for the creatures. Um, but even if something really important was happening, he'd still have to go back up again. Um, and so that for me was really interesting to, um, to think about and to have drawn attention to in this film um, compared with other ocean documentaries that really try to erase the presence of the film, the, the cinematographer, uh, even if they're a bubble disturbing presence of a scuba diver, you know, and that's usually who's doing the filming like down there, down there with their work. So that really struck um you know, that really struck me, but 
you know, other discussions of my octopus teacher have questioned, um, you know, elements like the sort of queer love between the beloved octopus and um, Craig, um, the protagonist who like goes down to see this octopus. Um, there's actually a pretty good Twitter thread on <laughs> um, someone, someone posted um, and, uh, you know, some like kind of other cringy, cringy sort of moments related to that. But at the same time, like it's really um, an interesting film to look at as a as a media theorist because of the way that Craig also documents um, like the he draws a map of where the octopus of the octopus burrow and all the meaningful um, sort of tracks and traces around it. And um, that's a document I would I would like to think with more just because of how it sort of um, is is about this practice of noticing uh, what's significant in the octopus's world. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Courtney, if there's uh, time for me to do a really quick follow up question, is that okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, one of the things I, uh, uh, I was also thinking of the moment, uh, it, the pandemic, uh, this is a time when breathing for those of us uh -huh. who are terrestri <laughs> terrestrial bound creatures, uh, breathing is being questioned or at least denaturalized, uh, yeah. uh, at least uh, this common mode of breathing. Uh, so I'm really curious about your thought. I mean, one can even argue that all these attention to the non-human, mm -hmm. including the virus, including shows like Tiger King or My Octopus Teacher are somewhat connected, yeah. perhaps. That may be a stretch. And there's also Squid Game. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I'm kind of really curious what you might say the lesson that your work might provide for us in this moment too, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the kind of very uneven experiences of the pandemic, which bring to mind you know, longstanding histories of environmental mm -hmm. racism and so yeah. forth. Yeah, so just really curious if you would offer us a bit more insight. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I'm not sure how much uh, there is that's new that my work offers, but I would say that it's, um, in conversation with many other discussions that really are trying to draw attention to the breath as um, as something as something important, as something that's part of a commons, um, as something that's um, shared. Um, and in scuba diving, like you're you're just very aware that you're you're very aware of yourself as a as a breathing body, um, and breathing is how you sense. Um, discomfort or something that might be, you know, maybe unsafe. Um, breathing is about time. It's about um, air consumption. So you always try to sip your air, not gulp your, your air to maximize your, your time underwater. Um, and that kind of, um, att you know, attentive attentiveness to the breath is something that um, maybe indirectly, but still shares, I think, a lot of, um, you know, uh, similarity with other conversations about the the air so the pandemic being a big one but also like i live in california and so wildfires and uh the share the, the commons of the air is something huge i also think of tim Choi's uh writings on um uh conspiracy like what i mean conspire means to breathe um together um so he thinks about that the significance of that etymology um, as does um, another anthropologist, uh, N Natasha Myers, and I really like her work on in um, sort of uh, the field of plant studies um, as she as she's thinking about plant human conspiracies, um, not as something that's just secretive, but um, actually about breathing together. Um, and I think that has a lot of potential for connections with the ocean too, because the ocean, as I you know, sort of quoted earlier in my presentation, the ocean produces over half the world's oxygen because marine phytoplankton are just always photosynthesizing and the byproduct is oxygen. So thanks marine phytoplankton you know, for, uh, for, for this. Um, but I think there, there's all these very real multi-species and also metabolic ways to tune into um, the co-production of this um you know of, of different kinds of air um together and so another question i've been interested in is what's the what um what might you see differently if um you think not only about ecology but also about metabolism 
um, and the and the way that metabolism is about uh, is about breaking down and um, creating things and nutrients is about sustaining life, about eating relations. But it's and the way it's also um, deeply economic too, and about cycles of um, you know consumption, production, destruction. Um, and the like. And so I think that the air is not something that's just elemental or static or kind of enduring over time, but something that is actively in a metabolic relation with um, human beings and other multi-species partners, because we're changing it all the time through um, our own carbon emissions and the capitalist economy that we find ourselves in. But at the same time, um, other multi-species beings have are, always been air shaping agents. Um, including something um, marine biologists like to think about the great the great oxygenation event that happened when um, X million years ago uh, when the Earth had an entirely different atmospheric um, uh, makeup and then suddenly um, a kind of uh, threshold of organisms began um, photosynthesizing and releasing oxygen and that's who we have to thank for our current atmosphere. Um, so I think. You know, these are it's, it's challenging, but I think that in even thinking about air, it's useful to compare these kind of different a, a address, different scales and different actors in this co-production of the changing and um, non-static um, air that that we find ourselves in. Yes, absolutely. I can't breathe as the voice of protest Black Lives Matter. Um, I think of, um, you know, Christina Sharp's work has been really influential for me, like in the wake on blackness and being um, and uh, also the the fiction, um, the sonic science fiction about uh, Drexia uh, as um, this uh, fictive imagination that, you know, what if the unborn um, babies of women um, cast overboard in the Middle Passage somehow could breathe underwater. Um, so that's another kind of amniotic science fiction that centers um, the capacity to breathe as this uh, this um, science fictional element to think with and to sort of, sort of um, re reimagine um, a different element of um, belonging um, where, that centers the ocean. So there've been a lot of really amazing fictions that sort of take up the Drexia um, mythology and run with it in other directions um, from River Solomon's um, recent book to uh, clipping and um, a piece they they composed um, for, uh, I think, an NPR podcast. OK, I went for a while there. Um, other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. If there are any other questions or comments, we have uh, uh, someone who chatted that they can't wait to to dive in and read your book. I'm sure oh, they, you. <laughs> I'm sure a pun was intended there. Um, yeah, the puns are, are widely available. On all of them. <laughs> um, to Ibrahim, the, the recording will be on um, the Just for Center for the Humanities uh -huh. um, YouTube channel. So it should be going up tomorrow. Oh, wonderful. Um, um, I guess I can say also for anyone still listening um, that uh, I've been thinking a lot about how diving can be a method in the humanities, not just diving as something for the sciences. So I have a piece coming out soon that really tries to um, articulate this um, and expand on some of the conclusions at the end of Wild Blue Media um, to say that, hey, look, you know, um, diving is about new conditions of interpretation um, and can grant you access to um, spaces that otherwise you'd have to rely on, um, you know, someone else's reports about. Um, so, so I think that this is um, one possible fieldwork trajectory in the blue humanities. Um, Jason Lavilio has a comment. Um, I said the expanse, the TV show, pays a lot of attention to the very different mm. atmospheric pressure on Earth and Mars. The skeletons of Martian humans are different. Interestingly, the Martians who visit the Earth are most fascinated with seeing the ocean. Aww. I haven't seen the expanse, but that's an interesting um, sort of, uh, you know, conceit for the the Martians, um, maybe due to the own, their own scarcity of water on their their planet, right? Um, and this taps into a longer um, uh, trope that Stefan Helmerich writes about, where the alien, or sorry, the ocean is characterized as alien, but in the example Jason just mentioned, it's like the ocean is alien for the Martians, um, right? Like it's this other sort of touristy. Uh, environment to um, to explore. Uh, so that's where I would sort of be curious to um, uh, take uh, to take some thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, any other questions or comments from the audience? I actually do want to ask another thing, if that's Go possible. It, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, I'm really glad you brought up the example of uh, Snapchat, the uh, disappearing messages, which is also available in Signal, uh, if not other chatting mm -hmm. uh, messengers. And um, I, uh, I couldn't help but also think about this uh, ephemerality idea uh, uh, in relation to your discussion of the uh, inscription. And um, one thing that came to mind was uh, as you know, well known censorship practices on the Chinese internet and the ways in which oftentimes uh, the erased texts sometimes carry or carry through um, memes or images of a different sort. Uh, so it seems to resonate with your point about the agency of the reader uh, in, in participating in that process. Um, so I was just really curious if there's more connection to contemporary digital media practices uh, from your work uh, that you would be willing to share. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, I'm not quite sure where I would go with this um, except maybe to say that um, you know context is always the hard thing uh, that uh, censorship or algorithms for censor censorship um, often miss and so the metaphoric fluidity <laughs> or linguistic gymnastics that you know people can kind of um, use uh, is something that um, often is highly context um, you know context dependent um, and so that seems to be where like a lot of the skillful negotiation or evasion is, is happening. So I think maybe there's some, you know, um, something to say around exploring uh, the sensitivity to context um, in, in both there. Um, I also just noticed uh, Jason's comment in the chat um, about the poem Diving into the Wreck by Adrian Rich. And uh, I love this poem, um, but I, I will, I can't say one thing, like as, um, as a diver, uh, there's one unrealistic part that I think is interesting and worth discussion, which is that like in the in the poem, the diver uh, descends the ladder um, in order to get under water. And there's the beautiful line, like my flippers cripple me. And this is something I definitely experience um, on land like the and uh, if you try to wade into the water with your flippers, you're, you might fall over like the, it's very um, unwieldy. Um, and Stephanie Merchant, um, who's a sports studies scholar and um, um, in, uh, based in the UK, uh, has also done a lot of diving ethnography. And I was really inspired by her, her piece, Deep Ethnography. And there's a great line from that where she talks about diving equipment, you know, all, the, all these prosthetics um, coming into being with the environment. So once you take yourself and plunk underwater, then you stop noticing the um, the equipment because it's designed for you to be comfortable and to, to be there. Um, so there's a kind of this negotiation um, in these amphibious practices, right? Of like noticing and then forgetting what you have, what you have on you. Um, so in diving the wreck, the one thing you wouldn't do is actually take your flippers and walk down the ladder. That's how you get out of the water. The way you get into the water is you take, you can do two things. You can roll off the back or of the, of like the side of the boat or take just what's called a giant stride and like step and fall into, into the ocean. So no ladders involved. <laughs> and, uh, you would feel the flippers cripple me on the way up, not the, not the way down. Any, oh, we have a, I think another. Jason says, I'm nodding this interface, not showing. <laughs> Okay. So, <laughs> any other questions or comments? Um, Jason says, great talk. <laughs> um, okay. Um, okay, there's just some people who are making, sending comments to me. Um, okay, if there are no more questions, I'm putting in the chat a link to our YouTube channel where, where it'll be tomorrow morning. You can also check out our previous um, events that we've had uh, this semester and ones previous. 
I would like to thank Melody for joining us this afternoon, although it's probably well, it's probably early afternoon for you. Afternoon. It's afternoon. Yeah, it's early <laughs> afternoon for you. Um, and thank you, Fawn, for for um suggesting her and and that we were able to to make this happen. And I hope all of you have a good rest of your day. Thank you.